Now we are finally beginning the text of Mark. We've done all the preliminary work over the last weeks. We know who the characters are, Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, Zealots. We will soon know the three titles that Mark uses to introduce us to Jesus. Now you've got to put yourself in the position of a Roman citizen, or at least someone who lives in Rome. You might be Jewish, you might be a pagan, you might be part of the new uh, Christian community in Rome. The year is 71 AD. The news has just reached Rome the year before that the great temple of Jerusalem has been destroyed by the Roman armies. It was a great architectural wonder and it's a catastrophe what happened, but the Romans were not very nice people. So, I, I, I didn't catch, where are we supposed to picture ourselves? You're in Rome. In Rome. Okay. There's a Jewish community, there's a Christian community, there's a large pagan population. The news has just reached the people who cared, that, well everybody cared, the Romans said, great, they destroyed the Jewish temple, wonderful, the Jews will be finished after that. <laughs> And the Romans are gone, but the Jews are still here. And then the Christians said, ha ha, Jesus predicted the temple would be destroyed because of the Sadducees whom he couldn't stand and their rituals and they, they didn't receive him and the high priest cooperated in his death. So the temple, good, it was destroyed. And the, the Jews were saying, oh my God, it's the worst possible thing. So this really separated the two communities. Their reaction, and the Romans rejoiced because the Roman armies had destroyed yet another alien people who dared to rise in revolution against the Romans. The Jewish war against the Romans was from 65 to 70 AD, and the Jews acquitted themselves brilliantly. They, they held down the great Roman Empire's army for five years, but the inevitable happened. They were slaughtered, a million Jews were killed, or sold into slavery. It was a disaster for the Jewish people. But the news got to Rome. And Mark, who had been a teenager, perhaps, at the time of Jesus' arrest, remember that young man in Gethsemane who runs away naked into the night when someone tears his tunic off, may be Mark's signature on his own book. So Mark may have known Jesus just during the last week of his life in Jerusalem. And there is a tradition that the early church in Jerusalem met in Mark's mother's house. But he was a nobody. He wasn't one of the twelve disciples. But Peter and Paul had just been murdered, executed, by crazy Nero, who burned Rome, we believe, and blamed it on the Christians. After all, the Christians were predicting that the world would end with fire. And so, you say it, maybe they did it, said Nero, who probably did it himself to make room for a great palace, the golden house that he was building. He destroyed the center of the city, and he was quite mad. But they blamed the Christians. And in the terrible persecution, you know the stories, throwing to people to lions and all kinds of horrible stuff, Peter and Paul, the two great pillars of the church, according to Paul, Paul was the disciple to the Gentiles. His job was to bring the Gentiles in to the church. Peter was the disciple to the Jews. He was to bring the Jews in. Well, it didn't. If you read the book of Acts, it doesn't really work that way. Peter was, in fact, the first person to convert a Gentile, Cornelius, an Italian soldier uh, of the Roman Empire. And so he made that breakthrough. Remember, it was very difficult for them to go to Gentiles. Early Christians were Jews. They called themselves Jews in Christ or Nazarene Jews. And so Christianity, together with Essenes and Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots, was a, a Jewish party. And that's how it started. All the disciples were Jewish and the early converts were. But then the Jews stopped converting because they had a, a vivid, active religion. But nobody believed in the Roman gods anymore. And so the church began to have more success with Gentiles, with non-Jews, than with Jews. And Peter and Paul were involved in that double outreach. 
Well, Peter and Paul were killed by Nero, we believe 64 AD. Peter crucified and Paul beheaded. And so the two main characters who shaped the thought of the early church, Paul is the man who really created Christianity as a theory of what the blood of Christ accomplished on the cross. He was the first one in the 50s AD to speak of that. They were gone and Mark stepped into the breach. No longer a teenager, it's 40 years after Jesus' death, so he's something like 55. And I believe what happened was he sat down at a desk, not unlike this, but of course it wasn't plastic, and he called for everyone to send him memories of Jesus. And he probably had, in my imagination, I see him having, piles of parchment, little snippets, miracle stories, healing stories, beautiful sayings, uh, run-ins with the Phar Sadducees, conflicts with the Pharisees, his death on the cross by the Roman governor, all collected, and then he started putting it together. We don't know if it's in the right order, probably not. As I said last week, it's not likely that Jesus had five run-ins with Pharisees, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but that's, Mark just put them together neatly. He threw in every story anyone told him. Somebody said Jesus fed 5,000 Jews with a few loaves and fishes. He put that in. Someone said, no, they weren't Jews. It was 4,000, they were Gentiles. Well, so he put that in. So now you have two accounts of the feeding of the thousands. He wasn't taking any chances. And someone said, my Uncle Harry was there when Jesus said so and so. I'll put that in. I, my Aunt Tuddy was there when uh, he cured uh, a leper. I'll put that in. He just put it all in, and he tried to organize it as best he could into a synopsis of scenes, which is then followed later on by Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. John departs from it. But we have the synoptic Gospels. But the order of things may not reflect the actual order in Jesus' career of three years, but it may, it's, it's the way Mark organized it, with the week at the end in Jerusalem. Okay. With that understanding, Let's begin. Noticing the structure. Bring your Bibles from now on every day. What's the first sentence? It wasn't called the Gospel of Mark until the second century, which identifies it with Mark. I have reason to think it's probably accurate that he did write it. I don't think Matthew wrote Matthew, and I don't think John wrote John, but I think, for reasons which would take an hour to explain, I think Mark wrote this and Luke wrote Luke. But it was just in those days, you would identify a book by the first word or the first phrase. For example, the Jews still call the book of Genesis the book of Bereshit, which means in the beginning or at the beginning of. That, that's the first word in the, in the book of Genesis. Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning created God. God created the heaven and the earth. All right, so this book was known. Again, look how it begins with the word beginning. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Translation. The beginning of the good news. Gospel means good news. Of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So right here you have two of the three titles that Mark will use to introduce his readers to who Jesus was. Because you were a Roman in 71 AD, you haven't any idea who Jesus was unless you're a Christian. And it was a small community. But he wants this book for everybody. Matthew is aimed at Jews. And Luke is aimed at Gentiles. But this book, a general Roman audience. The beginning of the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It's ambiguous. The word of is ambiguous. Does he mean the good news of Jesus, of who he was, or the good news brought by Jesus? Are we talking about the medium or the message? I don't know. The structure doesn't tell us. It could mean both. It's who he was and what he had to tell us. Obviously, Christianity is based on both. What does Messiah mean? What does Son of God mean? Mark was a Jew, a Christian Jew, but a Jew. Those are Jewish titles from the Old Testament. 
I have a chapter in this book of mine which is called The Question of the Messiah. It's many pages. There were many ideas of the Messiah knocking around at the time, including the Pharisaic idea of a king who would come and rule on David's throne and from Jerusalem would spread justice and peace and brotherhood throughout the world. The world would be transformed. Well, Jesus, in his, at least in his first coming, didn't do any of that. And that's why most Jews said he, whatever he was, a great prophet, he wasn't the Messiah. But Christians say he will do all that when he comes back. All right, we'll see. But what else does Messiah mean? To Christians, they redefined it. Now, they had a right to redefine it. It's in the public domain. And any of these Jewish sects, and Christianity was a Jewish sectarian movement, could define Messiah the way they wanted to. And the Christians said the Messiah will ultimately come and do what the Pharisees expect, to build a new world, but right now he's the one who comes and suffers and dies for the redemption of the world. To save the world, not by building an immediate kingdom, but by building it brick by brick, and the bricks are human souls. This Jesus speaks to the individual soul, and he builds the kingdom of God within. When we accept what he has done for us on the cross and say, what is the solution to sin? The Jews said, righteousness. Well, the Jews don't believe in original sin, so they said, we can be righteous even after Adam and Eve sinned. Cain had a choice whether or not to kill his brother. He didn't have to do it. God said, you have a choice, which means his nature was not corrupted by Adam and Eve. And it says, although the whole world was drowning in sin, Noah, Ish Sadiq, was a righteous man. So how could that be if everybody is now a sinner? But other verses in the Old Testament say, God looked down from heaven to find a righteous person, and he found none righteous, no, not one. So Christianity goes with those negative verses, and Judaism goes with the positive verses. It's everybody is a cafeteria Catholic or a cafeteria Protestant or a cafeteria Jew. You go into the cafeteria for brunch, you know these wonderful spreads they have, you go to after church on Sunday, and if you belong to a club or you go to the town and country in West Ashley, oh, what great college they have. And you have a thousand things to eat. And you say, well, I like the college, but I don't like the beets. Well, that's the way people are with religion. You can build a whole theology on a few verses in the Old Testament by ignoring the others you don't like. So Judaism is built on the verses that say people are still righteous after the, the events in Eden. And Christianity says, no, Everybody's nature fell and was corrupted. We inherit the nature uh, of Adam and Eve, at least most, most Christianity says that, and the result is people are born evil. That's why they have to be baptized, to wash that away. That's why we need Christ. You don't need Christ unless you believe you have to have re re be redeemed from something that we can't do on our own. Jews say sin is what we do. We can stop doing it. Christians say sin is what we are. We can't stop being what we are. Therefore, Christ must take on our nature. And the whole phrase that Paul came up with was not justification by faith, but justification by faith in God's righteousness. The Jews say human righteousness can overcome sin. If we are guided by the Bible, we can live a righteous life. The Christians say, no, you can't. Because even if your conduct is righteous, your motivation is so often selfish and compromised. Therefore, God has to become man and live a totally righteous life. And for the sake of God's righteousness in Christ, who poured himself out on the cross with no sense of self at all, he emptied him, that's called kenosis, he emptied himself. And for his sake, so we are saved. So righteousness, Jews and Christians agree that righteousness is the solution to sin. But Jews say humans have that capacity, undiminished by what happened in Eden. And Christians say, no, we no longer have it. Therefore, we must depend not on human righteousness, but on God's righteousness. I, I find endlessly fascinating the parallels between the religions, how they're the same in so many ways, but then at the end there's a little twist, and the Jews go this way and the Christians go that way. And there's wisdom in both. 
in the idea of original sin, oh, they're after the Nazis and the communists, people are capable of unspeakable things. And there's a new book about the inner life of the concentration camps. And it's one of these 800-page books. It's probably better used as a doorstop because they, the, the Times reviewed it this Sunday in the book review and they said it's so depressing. It's unbelievable what these Nazis did. Unbel it's unthinkable, the cruelties that were imposed by t totalitarians in the 20th century, a ghastly century. Well, when you see that, you think maybe the Christians have a point about original sin. But then you read about the extraordinary heroism of people fighting against totalitarians, the communists, the Nazis, and you think, ah, oh, but the human race produces such noble people. Maybe the Jews are right about that. Well, we need each other. Judaism can become Pollyanna-ish about human nature unless we have the Christians to point out sin. And the Christians can become depressed about sin unless they have the Jews to say, Bob, that there's a capacity for righteousness. So interfaith dialogue, which is so widespread, we have a Jewish Christian council here, here I am a Jew teaching in a Christian church, and vice versa. Uh, in Christian seminaries, you have rabbis on the staff. In Jewish seminaries, you have ministers and priests. We live in a great age in which Christianity and Judaism are cross-pollinating each other and influencing each other and opening up to each other. And we both have traditions of great wisdom. Whatever the Jews know is true, but it's not complete. Whatever the Christians know is true, but it's not complete. Because no revelation can be complete. God is infinite and we're finite. You can't pour an infinite amount of something into a finite vessel. And Judaism and Christianity are finite vessels which try to get the infinite truth of God and have a lot of it, but God still has more to tell us. And if we talk to each other, we get closer to the infinite, which is the truth which remains in God. All right. There's an editorial for good Jewish Christian dialogue. But let's now look at the second Psalm. In the Old Testament, that's where we will find the term Messiah and the Son of God. The second Psalm, Book of Psalms, number two. The Psalms, if you look carefully, you'll see they were set to instrumental music. They were the hymns that the Levites, the lesser priests, would sing in the temple courtyard. And that was the liturgy of the time, the psalms. And this, each psalm is for an occasion in the liturgical life of ancient Israel. The second psalm is the coronation anthem. As the high priest poured sacred oil on the head of the new king of David's line, the choir would sing this hymn. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Now that's very, we, we read the Psalms, I keep them next to my bed and read them before I fall asleep, but that's nice. But the original context is specific. What's happened here? The old king of David's line has died. And that's why they need to anoint a new one. They didn't crown him, they poured oil on his head. And in between the death of the old king and the, and the anointing of the new, this was a time of peril for the Davidic empire. David's empire was so big, well not big compared to the Assyrians or the Babylonians, but for a little people like the Jews, it was big. And it contained more non-Jews than Jews. All kinds of uh, Edomians, uh, with, I was one group, and uh, they were the original Edomites, and all kinds of ites all around, Ammonites and whatever kinds of ites there were. And they were part of David's empire. And they perhaps were not thrilled to be ruled by a Jewish king. Maybe they wanted to be independent the way they had been before David the great conqueror conquered them. So when the old king died before they could crown the new one, anoint the new one, that would be a time when the local kings of these local populations, which were under the suzerainty of the Davidic Jewish king, would think of rebellion. 
well, the empire is weak now. David, uh, they, the, the king is dead. They haven't yet anointed a new one. Now it's time to rebel. So that's what this refers to. The folly of those subject nations plotting to get out from under the Davidic rule. They take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Now who is the anointed? Is the king. He's anointed with oil. And the word in Hebrew for anointed is Mashiach, Messiah. That's all it means. Every Davidic king was originally called the Mashiach, the anointed one, because oil had been poured on his head by the high priest. Originally, every king was a Messiah. Now, later on, when the Davidic kingdom fell in 586 BC, when the Babylonians conquered it, Jeremiah, the prophet, was alive at that time and he saw the ruin of Jerusalem and the destruction of the first temple and of the empire and the killing of the king and his sons. Hezekiah was murdered after seeing his son. They were cruel. They killed his sons in front of his face and then they put out his eyes. So that would be the last thing you would see. My God, keep people are capable of horrors. In any case, he had dared to rebel against the great, Ro uh, great Babylonian Empire. To me, he's a hero, but poor man had a terrible fate. In any case, when the Davidic kingdom finally fell in 586, long after this was written, the prophet Jeremiah, witnessing this, took the term Messiah and f did two things with it. He futurized it and perfected it. This is what's known as classical messianism. Originally, Messiah meant any king on the throne of David, but the, under with Jeremiah and Isaiah, they redefined it to be a king of the future. Might be the near future, might be the distant future, who would be sent by God. He wouldn't be divine, he was a human being, but he would be an ideal and perfect king not flawed the way all the, even David. His public life was great, but his private life, he took Bathsheba and all that horrible stuff, and left much to be desired. So he was, as a way, he was an imperfect vessel. But the Messiah would be perfect and would come in the future to reign over the kingdom of David and the whole world. That's what Christians expect Christ to do in the second coming and what Jews still expect a Messiah to do when he comes. So, Jeremiah changed it to classical messianism. So the term Messiah has two meanings. Number one, the original term, king of Israel, period. Doesn't suggest divinity at all. Not the way the Jews used it. Second meaning, a perfect future king of Israel. Still doesn't suggest divinity, but a glorious, perfect human being, but not a divine being. Keep those two in mind. So Mark must mean those two things. When he says Jesus is the Messiah, he means he's the king of Israel. Now, does he mean the Jewish people or the new Israel, the church? He could mean both. The king long expected by the Jews, but also the king of a new Israel. After all, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. He reconstituted Israel symbolically in his Christian movement. And then, or whatever, he didn't call it a Christian movement, but the early community around him. So those are two meanings for Messiah. And of course, it's folly for those subject kings to plot against the Davidic king because he's the Lord's anointed. To oppose the king on David's throne is to oppose God. That's what this first sentence is saying. The divine right of kings. There's a saying, not all the water in the deep blue sea can wash the oil from an anointed brow. T.S. Eliot quotes that. He said, I'm a monarchist in political sentiment. Very traditional British view, but it comes from the ancient Jews. God has put his anointed on the throne. Well, so did the, the Mesopotamians. The Babylonians believed this too. Everybody believed either their king was a god or the anointed of God. And the Jews went with the anointed because their notion of God is so high and exalted that no king could be a god. All right. Verse 3. 
This is what the rebellious subject kings are pondering. Let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. That is the bonds and the cords of the Davidic Jewish kingdom. We can have our freedom as Edomites again. But it's folly because they're opposing not only the Jewish king but the Jewish God. This is God's response. You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? You think there's no humor in the Bible? I've heard lectures on that. Bible's got everything, but not human. Lies. In the book of Genesis, it's a funny scene in the Garden of Eden when God says it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make him a helper. And so then God creates the animals. And he brings candidates to Adam to see whom he wants to date. Look at this one. It's got spots. Look at that long neck. And Adam says, I'll call, and you can name him, Adam. And Adam says, we'll call it her giraffe. Well, do you like her? Hmm? For your consort to be a helper? Nah, and that's not going to work. Well, all right, bring the cow. He's a nice cow, a nice horn. Oh, lovely. You want her? No. I will call her cow, but she's not going to be my girlfriend. So there's a whole list of candidates. It's quite funny. And then God, Adam says no to all of them. And then God says, I know the kind of kid this is I've created. He loves himself. So I'll make him somebody who looks a lot like him. Not exactly, but a lot. And I'll make her from his rib. And so he does, and Adam wakes up, and he says, he takes a look at Eve, and he says, oh, baby, God, you got it right this time. And so there you have, thus shall a man leave his father and mother and become one with his wife. They become one flesh. All right. That's humor. Here we have humor, too. It says, it's a derisive laugh, but God is still laughing. When these kings try to burst asunder the control of the Davidic king, he who sits in the heavens laughs. It's not just the king on his throne in Jerusalem laughing at them, it's God laughing. You can't fight this. I put Israel here, and that's that. The Lord has them in derision. Remember, when God called Abraham, he said, blessed are those who will bless you, and cursed be those who will curse you. And Winston Churchill, in his youth, wrote a major essay saying, I believe that. Look at the history of the world. Those nations that were good to the Jews have prospered, like England. And those nations, like Tsarist Russia, that were evil to the Jews, were swept away. And the Soviet Revolution was the punishment for persecuting the Jews. Well, that's his view. But he accepts what God says. I'll curse those who curse you and bless those who bless you. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Zion is one name for the mountain, or the other one is Moriah, where the temple stands in Jerusalem, or stood in Jerusalem. And the mountain is still there, but there's a mosque there and a Muslim shrine. I set my king on Zion, where he was anointed in the great temple, my holy hill. I did it. You're not going to fight the king, David, because that's fighting God. So give it up, boys. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. Who now is the king of David's line? Now, who is speaking? The Davidic king is speaking as of verse 7. First God was speaking, then the king is speaking. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He, God, said to me, the king, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now the Jews believe that when King David was born, he was just an ordinary kid. Some say he was a harpist. Some say he killed Goliath, so he's a brave soldier. But it wasn't until that sacred oil was poured on his head that he became an adopted son of God. So here's our second title. First, Mashiach, Messiah, anointed one, king of Israel, but also son of God. What did the Jews mean by son of God? They do, did not mean and they do not mean what Christians mean. Christians mean that Jesus was divine. But the Jews meant the king was the adopted son of God, adopted 
at the moment of his anointing by the high priest. Not born that way. He has no supernatural powers, but he is the adopted son of God. Other ancient peoples believe something very similar. You are my son. Today I've begotten you. Not the day you were born, but now you're reborn as my adopted son. With all the authority that suggests. Not divine authority, but earthly authority to rule. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All right, you will have great authority in this region and perhaps ultimately in the world. All right, so there are the two titles, Messiah and Son of God. So Son of God also means King of Israel. It's really a redundancy for Jews to say he's the Messiah, the Son of God. Both originally meant King of Israel. By, and son by adoption. Now Mark agrees with that. There's no Christmas story in Mark. There's no virgin birth in Mark. There are no wise men, there are no shepherds. Those beautiful stories are in Luke and also in Matthew, but not in Mark. As far as Mark is concerned, if we can argue by an absence of an argument, Jesus was an ordinary guy who came to be baptized by John the Baptist because John the Baptist was declaring the end of the world and you better wash away your sin and as a symbol of that you wash your body to show you want to wash sin from your soul to enter the kingdom of God which is about to burst upon the world. He, John the Baptist was certainly an apocalyptic preacher. He believed in the imminent end of the world. Maybe Jesus did too. So Jesus comes to be baptized for the remission of sin, but what happens is it turns out to be the coronation of the new king of Israel. And we'll see that scene in just a minute. So Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of God by adoption. Now, in addition to the Jewish title, son of God, which did not suggest supernatural powers or status, there are many scholars, not all agree, but many say, that the Greeks and the Romans also talked about sons of God. Caligula was an emperor, a crazy guy, and he had a serious illness, and he metamorphosed into a god, he said, when he came out of the illness. He was a divinized man and was now the son of God, and God help you if you disobeyed him because he was God's son. Taken on, his God's son during his illness. Now he was in fact a God. So when the Romans and the Greeks used this term, son of God, same term the Jews used, they meant something very different. The Jews were suggesting king of Israel, but nothing divine. But the Romans and perhaps the Greeks before them recognized some divinized men who at some point in their lives take on divine power. Now, I think Mark means this too. Remember, he's writing to a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles. And the Gentiles would have understood the Roman meaning of son of God as a divinized man with divine power. Now, why do I say Mark meant this too? Not just because of his mixed audience, but look at what Jesus will do. He'll confront Satan. King David could never do that. He's going to raise the dead. David never did anything like that. So that son of God for Mark means king of Israel, but also it means a man with divine power. Jesus talks to angels on an equal level and demons. The demons know him because they have supernatural vision and he's a supernatural as well as a natural being. Well, I don't like that distinction. Let's say he has extraordinary divine power. I don't like the natural, supernatural distinction because people who insist on supernaturalism have given up on the natural for revealing God. I mean, just look at the garden we're set, sitting in here, and Charleston is a garden city, and God's, we don't need stained glass here, we look through to the green, that's God's color of life. And when you look at what we call nature, 
Of course, the Bible doesn't use that word. It calls it creation. It points to a creator. But it's so glorious, if we can't find God in that, and we need God to do magic tricks for us to impress us, it means our faith isn't what it should be. If you don't see God burning in every bush, every bush is a burning bush. If you have Moses' eyes to see it, God is proclaimed in every tree, in every bush, in every blade of grass, this glorious, beautiful world that he's given us, the skies and the clouds. And what more do we want for a demonstration of God's power? Well, we're not satisfied, so we talk about supernatural beyond nature. There is no nature. It's all creation. It implies God. So, Christ has power in this gospel, which the Davidic king couldn't have. Therefore, Mark must also have in mind the Gentile meaning of Son of God, which means man with divine power. At some point in his life, he's given it. Here, it's at the baptism. All right, so the second psalm is the key to understanding those two terms. And remember, Messiah is only a Jewish term, meaning king of Israel or futurized perfect king, but son of God, the Jewish term is king of Israel, but the Gentile term is divinized man. Mark has them all in mind. That leaves only one term, son of man, which we'll talk about later. We haven't got to it yet. It's Jesus' preferred title, by the way. The beginning of this book is so carefully structured. You have to admire Mark. Nothing random. The beginning of the good news ab about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, or the good news brought by Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. I, I, I want to sing it, it's Handel. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Plunk, plunk. All right. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This is a quote from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, but it's a 